Good evening, everybody. I'm always so surprised it's so loud. <laughs> Maybe we can get it turned up. I never realized what a strong projecting voice I have. Welcome once again to this beautiful venue of McDonough Hall at St. Giles um, Parish Church Parish. And um, for our final night of the series with Dr. O'Leary, where we will look at the logos through the Gospel of John. I'll do a little more introduction about Dr. O'Leary, but I thought we should begin as we begin with all things um, with prayer. So hopefully you all have a um, All Souls Day prayer sheet. Um, we're not quite yet at that feast, but I think we're moving into that, that time of year when we remember the saints and the souls and it's an excellent time for us to pray together about that. So um, for the purpose of our prayer this evening, the first two verses I will say, and then we're going to alternate verses, the left and the right. And I will lead the left side verses. All of us will say the prayer, grant eternal rest, O Lord. And then the right side, which Peter will lead. And then um, the last verse I will read again. So perhaps we might want to call to mind this evening, particularly um, the recent gun violence in St. Louis School. I haven't had a chance to look at the news. I'm always afraid to these days to see if there's been any other tragedies. But we carry them to our hearts, but also if we each want to bring to mind those loved ones who are part of our lives, have been part of our lives, who have gone on for their eternal reward. So we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Merciful Father, as we approach the Feast of All Souls, we are called to remember those who have died, particularly those who have died in the past year, and pray for their joyful reunion with you, their loving creator. As your son taught us to call the stranger neighbor, our fallen are many. Names we will never know. Voices we have never heard. In lands we may never visit. Yet, brothers and sisters all, and so we pray for victims of war, caught in the crossfires of conflicts we could not quell, for soldiers and civilians, adults and children, we pray, grant eternal rest, O Lord. For those migrants who have died seeking a haven where they hoped to find safety and opportunity for themselves and for their families, we pray, grant, grant eternal, eternal rest, rest, O Lord. Lord. For victims of hunger, denied their share in the bounty you have placed before us, we pray. Grant, Grant eternal us. rest, O Lord. For victims of AIDS, malaria, Ebola, and other infectious diseases who died before adequate care could reach them, we pray. Grant, Grant eternal rest, O Lord. Lord. For those refugees seeking asylum from war, who died in a land that was not their home, we pray. Grant, Grant eternal rest, O Lord. For victims of emergencies and calamities everywhere, who died amid chaos and confusion, we pray. Grant, Grant eternal rest, O Lord. Lord, as you command, we reach out to the fallen. We call on you on behalf of those we could not reach this year. You raised your son from the dead, that all may share in his joyful resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So, welcome once again, as I started to say. Um, I thought I should give a little more formal introduction. I forgot last night we were YouTubing this, and so I thought it would be a probably appropriate for people to kind of know Dr. O'Leary a little bit better, who may be watching this from who knows what part of the world, right? <laughs> so Dr. Peter O'Leary is no stranger to many of us. 
Uh, one can find him in the classroom, whether it's at the Art, uh, Art Institute or University of Chicago, or even in a religious education classroom at Ascension Church in Oak Park. Um, we can also find him at the AMBO, proclaiming the word or prayerfully participating in our weekly assembly. An accomplished author and poet, Lectors will recognize his name for the LTP workbook for lectors as he moved us through the annual readings a few years back. His latest book, which is The Hidden Eye of Things, is the latest installment of his trilogy and will be available this evening from Tim Flesh, who's in the back there. And uh, it's a, a bargain price tonight of only $20 <laughs> and the author's own signature. So that's something you might consider. Um, I also want to thank the Lifelong Learning and Adult Faith Formation Committee, who has worked so hard and diligently in welcoming you each night and also in um, encouraging all of us to figure out what are the best ways to reach our adults. And um, Dr. O'Leary is certainly one of those good ways to do so. So again, thank you and welcome to Dr. O'Leary. Okay. Good evening. Nice to see everybody here again. Um, so this evening we're going to look at the Gospel of John. And what I'd like to do um, is follow essentially the same format as uh, that we followed uh, yesterday evening, which is to say, it's, it'll be even briefer, but I want to just briefly orient us in terms of the, the approaches that we're going to be looking at or we have been looking at. And I want to uh, provide the, the guiding premises for thinking about the Gospels themselves. We talked about uh, yesterday evening those of you who were here, some of you weren't, so it'll be just a little bit of a refresher. And then I'm going to introduce the Gospel of John to you, um, talking about uh, when, it was, when it was written, who uh, the, the author is traditionally understood to be, and then, and then what we understand about the author in terms of content and context. And then uh, a little bit unusually, uh, in, the, in the past I've, I've kind of provided a summary of the gospel just as a way of thinking about how the whole thing uh, whole thing moves, how it's narrated. John's gospel is so different. instead I'm going to I'm going to characterize it. Uh, so and, and hopefully that'll be clear enough for you as well. And then we're going to look at two passages from the Gospel of John in relation to tonight's thematic approach, interpretive approach, which is which is, the mystical or anagogical approach, okay? So to begin, the, I wanna to, want to provide, again, this sense of how we're, we're approaching the Gospels as a whole. This is our, these are our guiding premises. So the first, you'll recall, the Gospels do not constitute a reliable historical record of the life of Jesus during the first century of the Common Era, they weren't written to be historical records, and their inconsistencies have made that very challenging over the centuries. Instead, they were written to establish that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah, and that Jesus is the Word or the Logos. And that's what we're going to be talking about this evening. So we'll We'll get some we'll, we'll we'll get some clarity on that, or at least we'll we'll create a, a mystical prospect for for thinking about the logos. So the second of the guiding premises is that the gospels reflect in their context and milieu uh, in ways that are powerful and affecting, drawing the traits and ideals of antiquity forward to the present day. So they they reflect their context and milieu. Um, and those elements are Hellenism, and this is the, the ideal of the Greek religious and cultural imagination. Um, and we see this in the fact that the Gospels were written in Greek, as is the entirety of the New Testament. Um, the, 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 the traits and ideals of prophetic Judaism, this is where we get the messianic ideal. Um, 
And then finally, that of the Roman Empire. And that's where we get the event of the crucifixion, especially, but also uh, a relationship between Christianity and empire, which, which is going to, um, it's going to take a few centuries, but it's going to, they're going to join together and, and in effect become inextricable. We discussed that briefly, I think, in the, the, the uh, Q&A last night, too, when we talked about the role of Paul, especially Paul, ending up in Rome in, at the conclusion of, of Acts. Okay, so that's the second of the guiding premises, these, uh, the, 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 the context and milieu. So the third is that the Gospels are richly literary and imaginative productions. They're written with a combination of clarity, inventiveness, immediacy, and mystery that defines the ideals and purposes of storytelling and art. And for me, this, this comes through in the, 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 the sense that the, the Gospels are filled with what I think of as symbolic reality. Symbolic reality, this, this word symbol, which we probably have a, a, a definite sense of it or, or certainly an operating sense of what the word means, and we use the word all the time. It's one of these words that comes from, from it, its etymology demonstrates um, how valuable, how useful a word it is. So sim, S-Y-M, it's always together. <clears throat> Sin is the same thing. It just depends what the next sound is in the word. And so this means together. And bolos means to throw. So a symbol is to throw something together. And, and you can think of it in terms of its functional quality that way. Sometimes we want symbols to be specifically one thing and they can't move out of that category or they can't move out of that understanding. But the truth is they're, they're energetic. A symbol is something entirely energetic and it has the quality of attracting meaning. It has the quality of repelling meaning as well. And I think it's useful to think about the gospels as symbolic in the sense that they attract and scatter meaning in all kinds of intriguing ways, um, which is why we're still actively reading them 2000 years hence. And presumably a thousand years from now, it will, there will still be the same kind of energetic engagement with the material that's in the Gospels. So towards that end, we have these four interpretive strategies. Briefly, the literal approach, the moral approach, the allegorical approach, and then finally, the mystical or anagogical approach. I keep saying mystical or anagogical because Dante, who is the person in whom these approaches originated in his letter to Con Grande della Scala, who was his, his sponsor, his patron. Um, Dante used the word, he used the word anagogical and it has a place in terms of um, in church, interpretive thought in the church. It goes back before Dante, he, wasn't, he didn't invent the term, but it means effectively the same thing as mystical. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, how to characterize these? Again, just briefly, Dante understood the literal to mean what the letter itself signifies. So it's more or less what we mean by the word when we use it, uh, except if, if you're a teenager and you're saying literally, you know, it's not an intensifier in that way. But um, I also want to, again, carefully distinguish it from what I characterized last month, those of you who saw the first two lectures, as literalism. So the literal approach is not the literalist approach. The literalist approach is to exclude all other approaches uh, in favor of the literalist approach. And that one is, it's highly problematic. Of course, everything has a literal meaning. It's the surface meaning or it's the descriptive meaning, however you want to think of it. But the literalist approach, which excludes other 
other interpretive approaches is, is very strange. Uh, and I mean that in the sense that it would be very strange to the writers of these gospels and the audience that first, uh, first heard these stories or shared them. It would be bizarre to them that people 2,000 years from that point would be taking only the literal meaning uh, as, having, as having value. So just a, a little way of distinguishing that. So the, uh, the moral approach for Dante was, well, he, he meant by it the conversion of the soul from the sorrow and misery of sin to a state of grace. I characterize that as more or less what we mean by improvement. Self-improvement, improvement of, of a group or other people. Dante understood the allegorical approach, which we talked about yesterday evening, to mean things related to visionary experience. Uh, and that's probably a little different from the way if you learned about allegory in, in school, you, you may understand it. Usually we think of it as a kind of direct substitution. One thing means this other thing. Uh, last month I gave the example from George Orwell's Animal Farm, which is one of the books that's widely read, or at least was in, in high school, even earlier than that. And you know, you understand, you understand that the pigs in the barnyard are the communists. It's like, that's who they are, that's the allegory. And it is, that's, that, that's, that's a completely appropriate use of, of allegory. But in Dante's sense of it, it means, it means seeing things with, your imagination. It's the, vi the, the visionary part of your, your soul is the, is the imagination. Um, and then finally for Dante, the mystical or anagogical uh, signifies the passing of the sanctified soul from the bondage of the corruption of this world to the liberty of everlasting glory. It's kind of a mouthful, but the gist of it is, it means something like uplift. That's, I think, a very good way of, of translating or thinking about anagogy. That's the noun for anagogical. Um, the, the, the great scholar of mysticism, Bernard McGinn, he really liked to compare anagogy to a term that the, uh, the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins devised for thinking about this this experience he this experience that he he regularly sought out and and uh, reveled in as far as his imagination was concerned and he he coined a word for it he referred to it as in stress in stress in in hopkins's writings you find it repeatedly he's usually actually when he's describing clouds, interestingly. He loved to describe clouds and he would talk about the in-stress of the clouds. I'll write this up there because it's a great word. Gerard Manley Hopkins. Um, I love that too. It just gives you a sense of what this mystical, what this mystical property is, uplift. Okay, so... Uh, even though we're going to be talking about the Gospel of John in relation to a mystical approach, it doesn't mean the Gospel of John should be limited to that approach. All of the four approaches are constantly active, but we're going to focus on the mystical approach just as a way of, of seeing and, and thinking about what's going on in John. Okay? So without further ado, let's take a look at Let's, let's characterize, let's talk about the Gospel of John. Uh, I can't help but beginning by saying one of these things is not like the other. <clears throat> it's so different. Now, Mary Catherine alluded to um, uh, a role that I played in the, the, the Guide for Lectors um, and Proclaimers of the Word. Vicki Tafano was the person who... who um, tapped me on the shoulder to get involved in this project. I learned a great deal from it. Um, in particular, uh, well, not just, not just as, a, as a 
you know, as a Catholic, but I learned a lot as a poet. It was really instructive to me. So, um, but, uh, you know, we're all aware of the liturgical cycle. We know, or we're maybe glancingly aware that it, sometimes it's year A, sometimes it's year B, sometimes it's year C. Uh, and those years are attached to the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So we're, we're in year C right now. We're getting close to the end. Um, and then we're going to reboot back to year A. And I'm, I'm still on board with year A. I got my, my copy of, of the, the new, the new workbook and my, my, you know, my marginal, my little marginal musings are there for all who are curious. But um, where's year D, one might ask. Well, there's no year D because one of these things, it's just not like the other. Uh, the place where we get John in, John fills in, in the liturgical cycle. John shows up importantly during, during the Easter season. Uh, and John also fills in some gaps in year B because Mark's gospel is short enough that it makes sense to throw in some, throw in some John and we get, we get the bread of life um, teaching and so forth. I mean, they're just, they're, there's a stretch of about five weeks, if I'm correct, Vicki is nodding. Yeah, Vicki's nodding. We get a stretch of five weeks where John basically comes in and pinch hits for, for, for Mark. Um, now, in some respects, despite being a good news about Jesus, John's gospel is so different from the three synoptic gospels as to have come from another planet. And yet it is the fountainhead for much of Christian theology and its positions and attitudes have been an influence in Christians continuously for almost two millennia. Um, I had the good fortune, this is 30, almost 30 years ago now, I had the good fortune of finding myself, it really was almost as accidental as that, finding myself on the island of Patmos, uh, which is, it's about, I don't know, 10, maybe 15 miles from the coast of Turkey. Um, and uh, it was extraordinary to visit it, first of all, but also to find myself all of a sudden immersed in this, this kind of Christian antiquity. Um, but on top of Patmos is, there's a town, this hushed town, uh, it's called Horos, which surrounds the monastery of John the theologian. And especially in the Orthodox tradition, he's almost always referred to that way. So it's not just, it's not just John, it's John the theologian. It's as if it originates in John. And in many, many senses it does. Okay. Let's date the gospel. Um, if you'll recall, yesterday evening, or if you were here, uh, if, if, if you attended the, the, the lectures back in, in September, the window is, is the window is, is it's, it's not, you know, there's no bullseye, but it's still pretty small. The window for Matthew between 80 and 90 in the first century. The window for John is between 80 and the year 110. That's a big window. Um, most scholarships, I'm sorry, most scholars, however, place it in the last, somewhere in the last quarter of that, probably between the year 100 and 110. But there's no, there's, there's, there's no accuracy when it comes to when, when the gospel appeared. Um, that, that means it's pretty late. Jesus was already dead 70 years if it appeared in the year 100. That's a long time. <clears throat> so by tradition, the author of the gospel is John, son of Zebedee, one of the 12. Uh, and he's the one who, oh, let's get John. I should have had him up here before. He's the one represented by the eagle there, okay? He's cut off in this. I, I, I couldn't find a, I could, for some reason, I couldn't find a full, an illustration of the full page. Now, 
when we talk about the context and content and how that tells us something about John, we talked about Luke yesterday. We have some ideas about him that he, he was very likely a Gentile, uh, that, that he seems to possibly have converted to Judaism before converting to Christianity, um, you know, that he seemed to live among the Gentiles as well. We just have certain contextual claims that we can make. With, with John, they're a, little bit, they're a little bit more unusual, which is that the gospel of John seems to have been written by a single author, but it's possible it was written by two. There seems to be, there seem to be places where there, there's a kind of revision that happens, okay? Um, so the second is the, the fancy word that they use for this second potential writer is the redactor. It just means somebody who edits and adds to an existing text. Um, so if that's the case, if there are two or if there's just one, um, I'll use the plural just for, for a kind of grammatical convenience. They are both broadly assumed to have been involved in what is called the school of John. There seems to have been a school of John by this point. Um, and this school is attributed to the so-called beloved disciple and would be responsible for the gospel, um, for the letter, the letters of John, and for Revelation. And the adjective Johannine, that's the, the adjective you encounter, refers to this school. Now, the likelihood that the same person wrote all of these writings is very small. Um, that they were written by the beloved disciple even smaller. John's a common name, you could say. But it's, uh, I, I'm more interested in conveying to you the sense of a school of John. That is, by, by this point, 70 years after Jesus died, there was a sense of the gathering importance of this, this notion of the logos. And that seems to be a focal point for this school of John. So we've talked about sources with the previous gospels, the synoptics. Mark is a source for Luke. Mark is a source for Matthew. And then we talked about the mysterious Q gospel. The source of John appears to have been original to the school of John. And that's another way of, it's a way of restating one of these things is not like the other. You know, it's the fourth gospel. Uh, it was probably written in the area of Ephesus, which is in present day Turkey, um, near the, the town of uh, the city of Izmir. So it's right on the coast. Um, actually not very far from Potmos. But some have, some have suggested that John originated in Syria. Again, there's no certainty. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the school of John and, and wanting to emphasize the idea of, of some, sort of compelling, some sort of compelling material that a group of people who were calling themselves John, or could have, could have conceivably been one or a few people, were interested in advancing at that time when it came to this new, this well, came to this good news. So I alluded to this um, when I was introducing things this evening. Um, while John follows a narrative, it doesn't tell a story in the same way that the synoptic gospels do. Few of the miracles to be found in the synoptics and none of the parables are found in John. Consider that. The parables are a significant part of the synoptic gospels. No parables. None of them. <clears throat> there are a few overlapping miracles, but John also has miracles that are unique to John. 
Instead, John presents a powerful, compelling, mysterious, and vexing argument about the simultaneous humanity and divinity of Christ, emphasizing mysterious divinity. So both of those elements are in play, but there's, a, there's an emphasis, a kind of direction towards mysterious divinity. So the gospel is organized into two large and distinct parts. One that can be called the book of signs. That's the earlier part, which describes how the word reveals himself to the world and to his own, but how they do not accept him. And the second that can be called the book of glory. That's the second, basically the second half. Uh, that depicts how the word shows his glory by returning to the father in death, resurrection and ascension. So where the passion in the synoptic gospels is typically confined to the final two or three chapters of that gospel, in John, the passion, which is the book of glory, covers almost half of the gospel. So you can see that there's a shift in emphasis. Almost half of it is concerned with moving towards, moving towards the event of the crucifixion. <clears throat> and, you know, our, our, I think our, our solemnest, our most solemn feast that we, uh, our most solemn occasion that we participate in as, as Catholics each year is, is the Good Friday liturgy, which is the, the, it's, it's the recitation of, of John's passion. It's incredibly powerful. <clears throat> so there's no ambiguity in, in John where the focus is among those who believe in Christ. Now, these two parts are introduced by a prologue, which we're going to look at, um, which is a poem about the nature of the word, and it's concluded by an epilogue, which depicts scenes of the resurrection. So as it happens, the two passages that we're going to look at come from, one comes from the prologue, one comes from the epilogue, okay? So rather than describing the events to be found in John's gospel, I'm gonna characterize the nature of its argument by looking at four of its features. There are more than four features, but we'll look at these four features. <clears throat> oh, and I should, I should say, some of you were curious about uh, Raymond Brown's introduction to the New Testament. These, these traits I'm, I'm drawing from, from Father Brown's work, okay? If you're curious, and the book is up here, and you're more than welcome to come leaf, leaf through it after we're done. So, Here's the first characteristic of, of John's gospel. It's written in a poetic format. I'll write, I'll write these down with each, with each of them just so that you can think about them. It's written in this poetic format. It's, it's unmistakable and different than what you find in the other gospels. <clears throat> so parts of John, especially the prologue, as we'll see, read like poetry, but the whole gospel is compelled by poetic expressiveness and the leaps in logic that characterize poetry. This is especially so in Jesus' speech. He, he sounds always like a poet. <clears throat> That's my experience. Strangely, along with this poetic format, the second characteristic is misunderstanding. <clears throat> so much of the argument in John is about how Jesus, who comes from above, must use the language from below to explain himself, using metaphors that are frequently misunderstood. And this allows Jesus to explain himself repeatedly, unfolding his doctrine and expanding on it theologically. 
So there's this, there's the, there's a quality of repetition, but with each reiteration, there's change and adjustment. And I think this, this creates the pattern for, for theology in Christianity. Related to the misunderstandings, there are twofold meanings. Remember we talked yesterday about how um, Ronald Johnson, my mentor, said, why would you go with one meaning if you could have two? Like, always better to have more than one meaning, always, according to the poet. So much of what Jesus says in John is understood to be operating on at least two levels. Partly, this is the source of the second characteristic, misunderstanding, but partly it's a function of a language of initiation that Jesus insists on. Some people know that he is truly, some people know what he is truly saying while everyone else is in the dark. This leads to the lure, the great desire to be included in the hidden meaning. Part of the poetic play of language in John enables the twofold sense of meaning that prevails there. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not just that there are those who misunderstand Jesus and then those who understand Jesus. Rather, there's a sense that as, as you come closer and closer in, as you're initiated more deeply into the mysteries, greater understanding will follow. And that's, that's part of the attraction. And then fourth, and this is a toughie, but you experience it when you, when you hear John in, in church or, or when you read John, irony. The Gospel of John is filled with irony. Jesus in John is an ironist, especially when it comes to correcting his argumentative sparring partners with sometimes derogatory, sarcastic, and even incredulous responses to their arguments. There's a lot of that. But that's not, that's sort of the, that's, that's mere irony. The irony in, in, that John is using is, is functioning also at a deeper level. Because Jesus is not merely insulting his antagonists. He also uses irony to get at the hidden truth. The ultimate irony being his willingness to sacrifice himself to redeem the sins of humankind in which he must die in order that they shall live. That's the ultimate irony, that Jesus dies so that we may live. And that in dying, he will be fully glorified and thereby communicate the spirit of life. So he dies in order to communicate the spirit of life. This is, uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, the great, let's call him philosopher, erstwhile theologian, uh, Soren Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard, uh, w- he, wrote his, he wrote his thesis on irony. It's called The Concept of Irony. Um, and he, he has a definition of irony in that that, that I've always found to be uh, incredibly helpful when thinking about it. Because usually we think about irony as satire, what we normally think of as satire, which is a form of art that is often making fun of some other thing towards, you know, getting towards some sort of, some sort of meaning. But irony has a, it has a, it has a more powerful function to it. And so in the concept of irony, Kierkegaard says, irony is, it is the trope, it is the part of speech that replaces meaning with itself. So you take something that's meaningful and you evacuate it of meaning and you replace it with whatever it is that you've said. And an example that he uses comes from, comes from a sort of a, a famous thing attributed to Socrates. He actually, he, he sort of beats Socrates up in, in Concept of Irony. If that sounds enjoyable to you, you should, you should definitely read it. Um, yeah, he, he uh, so when Socrates says, all I know is that I know nothing. It's, it's a fundamentally ironic statement. And what Socrates is taking is the meaning, a, a statement that's meaningful, all that I know. He's evacuating it of meaning and he's replacing it with himself. Um, but for Kierkegaard, 
the, the, the problem, the evacuative problem of irony was resolved by, by Christ's sacrifice because he actually, um, I'm saying this, Kierkegaard didn't say this. He, he put his money where his mouth was, so to speak. That is, he, he actually sacrificed himself. Okay, so let's now, I'm keeping, uh, keeping an eye on the time as, I've, as I did yesterday too, because I want to respect your, um, your attendance and, you know, give you a horizon to anticipate. Let's start with the, the prologue to the Gospel of John. Um, I'm going to scroll ahead here. Actually, I think I could do it more uh, effectively this way. Uh, oh no, I, I have another. I have another element to introduce before we look at the at the prologue. Specifically, what I want to do is is present to you four traits of mystical experience. Now, mysticism and mystical experience are not synonyms, but most people's understanding of mysticism comes from experience. And these traits of mystical experience are useful as we start to think about how you can read scripture with, with, with a sense of a mystical approach. How, how is that going to be experienced as you, as you approach this material? Like, are you, are you gonna be suddenly, you know, a beam of light going to appear above your head? The heavens open up, uh, an angelic, ah, probably not. However, there are certain traits, and these come from the great psychologist William James from his varieties of religious experience, okay? So they're up here, so I won't write them on the whiteboard for you. Um, these are really useful. So James describes mystical experience as and these are four adjectives that characterize it. The first is ineffable, which means it defies expression in fully intelligible terms that nevertheless ramify in meaning the more that you dwell on it or the, the experience ramifies in meaning the more that you dwell on it, okay? So mystical experience is inevitable, but it, it has this power, this ability to, to deepen and become richer. The second is, this is the, a fancy word that James uses, noetic. Uh, it comes from the Greek word nos, which means mind. It means it happens in the imagination. And I'll refer back to yesterday evening's talk and qualify that as the active intelligence. That is, mystical experience is something that happens in your imagination. It's also transient, which means that it happens in a burst and is hard to sustain. You don't have, you don't live a life of mystical experience. You have, you have transient mystical experience. And then finally, and this is a complex term in relation to this, James describes it as passive, which he means, he means by that, not that it's, it's, it's something that happens to you so much, although it is, but rather that it's something that is given to you. I think that's a useful way to think about the, the passive quality of mystical experience. Now, I can say without, you know, without any qualms, but also because, you know, ineffability, it's hard to describe, but I would say I've had, I mean, some of the greatest experience in, experiences in my life have been experiences of reading where all of a sudden the scales fall from my eyes. And for a brief period, it usually doesn't last very long. I feel like I'm, it's not, it's not that I'm, it's not that I'm seeing through the text that I'm reading, but I feel like I'm seeing, I'm seeing with the text. The text suddenly um, becomes a magnifier. You know, I, I find that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing through, I'm seeing in, I'm seeing around. Something happens. There's some sort of change. And then it shimmers and, and resettles to, to ordinary experience. So you move, you toggle occasionally, into a kind of non-ordinary experience. Um, I would, one of my favorite examples of this comes from poetry. 
the great poet Emily Dickinson said, she knew she was in the presence of a real poem, a great poem, when she felt like the top of her head had been removed. It happens. It's something that happens. It doesn't last, but it's something that I live for, you know? I, I always want it to happen again, and you never know when it's going to. Um, that's the transient, the noetic, the ineffable, the ineffable uh, part of it. Okay, with that, let's take a look at this this opening, the opening prologue. Now, I gave you verses 1 through 14 on the handout. I was a little worried about, I wanted it all to fit on one page, although that was a, a kind of a silly concern because we've got double-sided printing. Nevertheless, the, technically the prologue goes for another four verses, which I've included here. So they're not on your handout, but they'll be up here. Okay. So here's John's prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home and his own people received him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father." John bore witness to him and cried, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me. And from his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. You'll notice all of the parallels and the repetitions that we find here, but you'll also, uh, you'll also recognize all of these incredibly mysterious statements that, um, I mean, each, each one of these statements could be the basis of an entire theology. In the beginning was the word, stop there. But then add to that, and the word was with God. Okay, stop there. And then add to that, and the word was God. So there are all of these repetitions, and with each repetition, there's a slight adjustment, and the adjustment provides for a kind of advancement. It, it provides for a kind of movement forward. This is the thing called the logos, the word. <clears throat> There is a really, there's a really terrific analogy that uh, a scholar of religion named Wilfred Cantwell Smith came up with as he was, as he was um, conceptualizing one of, the, one of the central qualities of Islam. Um, specifically, uh, what the Quran the role that the Quran plays in terms of Islamic belief. And uh, Cantwell Smith, he, he coined a terrific word for thinking about it that reflects really powerfully to me back onto Christianity. So he said, as Christ is the incarnation, the word made flesh, so the Quran is the inlibration, that is the book, the word made book. 
So he came up with this word in liberation to compare to incarnation. And it's a way of thinking about what this word is that I find really, really potent. Christ is the word for Christians. Christ is the word just as the Quran is the word for, for Muslims. Intriguing. Okay. Here's this interesting fellow, John Scotus Eriugena. Uh, he lived, as you can see, in the ninth century. And uh, he's considered one of the great theologians of the first millennium. Um, he lived in Ireland. In fact, his name means John Irish Irish. <laughs> Because Scotus was, Scotia was where the Irish lived. And Eriugena is just a way of saying Irish born. He's, he's John the Irish born Irishman. You know, uh, it's like, where are his lucky charms? Um, he's, he's, he's a legend. If, if you study, if you study philosophy or, or, um, you know, Christian mysticism, you, you, you spend some time with, with this, this figure and he was, he was, one of the things he was best known for was this homily that he wrote about the prologue to the Gospel of John. He was, he was, he was logocentric, this particular, this particular thinker. Uh, and he was particularly interested in the logos as, that is to say, the word as this emanation from God. This is a word you find in a brand of or a style of mysticism which connects all the way back to Plato. It's usually called Neoplatonism. Uh, John the Scot Eriugena was definitely a Neoplatonist, which means that he accepted this notion of emanation. That is, coming from God, out of God's self, are waves, waves of creation. And in this, in this, in this over this ebullience of creation, this is what causes the differentiation that manifests for us as the Trinity. So, emanation, differentiation; these are very Platonic or very Neoplatonic terms. And Eriugena, he 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 loved this as a kind of discourse, uh, and and maybe you get a sense it's it's very poetic. You know, it's it's not. I find reading philosophy tedious. I can't do it and I, I, I lose the trail of thought very quickly. But I love, I love to read Neoplatonists. It's like reading epic poetry. You know, it just, it just keeps moving and surging. So <clears throat> here's his commentary on the logos. <clears throat> this is for you, Pat, if you can read. Yeah, you can. Ready? All things were made through him, Th through God, the word himself, through the very God word, all things were made. Do you see how there's this layering and intensification? It's very characteristic of this, this concept of the logos. And he adds to this. And what does all things were made through him mean, if not that as the word was born before all things from the Father, all things were made with him and by him. For the generation of the word from the Father is the very creation itself of all causes, together with the operation and effect of all that proceeds from them in kinds and species. Truly, all things were made from the generation of God the Word from God the beginning. These kinds of constructions, I think, are also typical of this theological prospect. I think Christian theology is incredibly creative. I think it's one of the cre most creative parts of, of Christianity. And it, one of the, the expressions of that creativity is, is making words up, you know? trying to find new ways to understand or accommodate these, these feelings, this, these parts of the imagination. So he concludes, here then, the divine and ineffable paradox. There's that word again, ineffable. The unopenable secret, the invisible depth, the incomprehensible mystery. Through him who was not made but begotten, all things were made but not begotten. 
That's just his meditation on the opening. In the beginning was the word. That, that's, that's, and that's only a part of it. He's just like, what does this mean? He's starting to unfold it. Now, in the midst of the prologue, um, if, we, if we go back, we find this phrase right here. Um, in him was life and the life was the light of men. So in Latin, that phrase is lux hominum. And here's his meditation on lux hominum. This is again John, John Scotus Eriugena. For God did not appear as an angel to angels, nor as an angel to humanity, but as a human being to both human beings and angels. God appeared not simply in appearance, but in true humanity, which he took upon himself completely in unity of substance. Thus, he presented himself, cognition of himself, to all who might know him. The light of humanity, therefore, is our Lord Christ Jesus, who in his human nature showed himself to all rational and intellectual creatures, revealing the hidden mysteries of his divinity, by which he is equal to the Father. So this lux hominum, this taking on the light of humankind, is the thing that enables the Logos to reveal the hidden mysteries of the divinity in God, in which, as far as Eriugena is describing, this is the part of the Son that is equal to the Father. This part that's being revealed through Christ's humanity. I love that too. Now, <laughs> this is an example of someone Here's the, here's the homily. <clears throat> this is the example of someone who was experiencing a way of uniting with the divine through the reading of the prologue to the Gospel of John. It's sort of like, if you want to play, I mean, None of you wants to do this, but somebody you know wants to. If you want to play Dungeons and Dragons, you got to have a player's handbook. Like you got to have the handbook that tells you all the stuff that you need to know in order to play the game. It's like the prologue to the Gospel of John is the player's handbook for mysticism. It's right. It's like it's right there. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to take that path, you can start looking at this particular passage. It completely, uh, it completely can hold up to your your reading and rereading of it. Like it will, it will accommodate however much attention you want to give it. Let's contrast this with. Or let's compare this to or set it alongside the second reading, which is much shorter. And this comes from the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John. And this is one of the, this is from the scene of, of Christ's, uh, one of his appearances after the resurrection. Um, and it, it's, it's another instance to, to invoke my namesake. In this case, wow. This is one of my favorite passages in scripture. So you may recall in the 21st chapter of John, the disciples are kind of moping, moping around and they see a figure on the beach. And the, they, of course, they don't recognize him. And I wonder who this lone figure, you know, with a familiar beard and robe. <laughs> well, who is this person who's preparing the thing we love most to eat? Fish. <laughs> you know, he's got a fire. He's roasting fish. And they walk towards him. And, and then, of course, they realize, oh, it's Jesus. 
<clears throat> and so here's a moment, an exchange. When they, that's all of the disciples, had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, this passage is often interpreted or, or sensed to be kind of a way for Peter to redeem himself for having denied knowing Christ. Um, the three times is really pointed in that regard. <clears throat> but we're going to look at it from a slightly different angle. And in doing so, I hope create a little shimmer there for you. Okay? So in ancient Greek, there were six words for love. Um, the first one is xenia, hospitality. That's where we get the guest host paradigm. You know, you, 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 if you have a guest, you have to host that guest. <clears throat> the next is uh, philautia, which means self-love. I put in brackets vanity. So it, it does, it does lead, this, this quality of love, self-love, leads to, can lead to vanity, at least in terms of the ancient Greek imagination. The third word is storge, which means affection. It's rarely used in ancient sources, but it came to mean the kind of thing we mean when we say uh, love of, of like extended family or love of country or region location. I put in brackets sports, like when people say, I love, you know, fill in the blank. That's, that's a form of storge. That's like, that's that kind of, that kind of love. And we feel it, you know, one, one loves one's team, doesn't one. Even when they're horrible. This is like the, the curse of, of growing up in Detroit and, and being a Detroit Lions fan. It's like, it's, it's a, it doesn't feel like love, but it is love in its way. Okay, and then these three forms here, they're, they're a little bit more familiar to us. So philia is friendship, okay? But it also has, it also, you know, philosophy is the love of wisdom. So the philo in philia they come from the same place. It's, it's, it's the French, it's the familiarity, the love that you experience in friendship. You experience that with wisdom and philosophy, for instance. Okay. Then there's eros, which refers to love, intimacy, and especially sexual passion. In particular in the, the ancient Greek sources. And then finally we have agape, which is higher love, or charity, and that's what's translated into the Latin texts as caritas. And this is, this, is the, this is the highest, most sublime form of love. Now, in English, we are completely uh, hobbled by the fact that we only have one word for all of these, which is love. In some respects, it's, it's kind of great because you can throw love at anything. Um, <laughs> But in another respect, it's a problem because there's a distinct difference between the, the, the love that you experience for a friend and, you know, erotic love. They're totally different. <clears throat> All right, how does this apply to our, our passage? Let's go back just briefly and, and revisit. Jesus first asks Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon, uh, Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Second time, Jesus asks, do you love me? Simon, son of John, do you love me? Second time, 
Peter responds to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Third time, Jesus asks Simon, son of John, do you love me? At this point, Peter's finally grieved. He's grieved because he's, he's already asked it, do you love me? And each time he said yes. He's like, you know everything. You know that I love you. So, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. That's the repetition there, okay? Take a look at this. <clears throat> and you can find this in, in a Greek New Testament if you're curious. So the first time, the word that Jesus uses when he says, do you love me, is a version of agape. So he's saying, do you have higher love for me? Do you have this transcendent love? Do you love me in this way? And Peter responds with philo. He's like, yeah, I love you. Philo. Second time, Jesus asks again. He uses a version of agape. He says, do you love me? And the second time, again, Peter responds by saying, philo. He's like, I love you. Philo. What's amazing is the third time to get Peter to understand what Jesus is trying to tell him. He uses a form of philo. He's like, okay, I get it. You're not there yet. Do you philo me? And finally, Peter's like, I already said I do. You know everything. I do. What I love about this passage is in, and I'm using the word neutrally, descriptively, in condescending. He has to come down to Peter. In condescending to Peter, he, he uplifts the passage. He creates a possibility for us to do the same thing. It's not easy. Caritas, it is not easy. Loving something more than you love yourself, loving something more than anything else, it's not easy. Uh, we have to work to get there. But we can get there because, at least in this exchange, Jesus is willing to come down to meet us. It's like, all right, here we go. And presumably, he's going to be able to, to lift us back up when he stands up straight. Yeah, I love that passage. It's just like a big opening. It's a big opening. Okay, look, we've gotten to 840. Uh, let's take a very short break to allow uh, people who feel like they want to depart to depart. And then we'll, we'll do some, some question and answering, but no, no later than 9, 9 p.m. because Mary Catherine has got a whip ready to crack. And a, and a broom. That's good. Why Greek rather than Aramaic? Mm, great question. I'll, so, you know, so, so the, the, the three languages, I mean, there were multiple languages in the Mediterranean at that point, but Greek was the most widely spoken. So some people argue or hypothesize, you know, it's, it's, it was the language of the marketplace and Christianity was, was a religion of the marketplace, which is to say people were, people were talking about it in the, the agora. It's the open place where things were ideas and, and goods were traded. Um, I mean, I think, I think it would be, let, let's say that there were, let's say that there were a gospel or something like it that was being written today. Um, you know, and, and let's say that the person it was about was somebody who, who was, you know, a speaker of a relatively small language group. That if it were be, being written today, it'd probably be written in English, even if that person didn't speak English, just because English has a universal quality. It doesn't mean it's the most widely spoken language on the planet, but it definitely uh, is, it's universally known. So it would be kind of like that, but 
shrink the world to the Mediterranean. That's my sense. Because the koine that the, the New Testament is written in, it's, it's, not, it's not like classical Greek. It's not like, it's not like Attic Greek, you know. Um, it, if, you can read, if you can read the Greek of the tragedians, you can read the Greek of the New Testament much, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy going. But um, going in the reverse direction would be harder. It would be like going from, it'd be like going from, you know, reading modern English to reading Shakespeare, which is a little harder. And then like, if you went back further and started to read Chaucer, you'd need to have a dictionary and less would make sense. It's kind of like that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I suspect it's probably convenience more than, than anything else. Can you give more examples of irony? <laughs> that's a good, that, that's, that's also a good question. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me see if I can get, give a good example um, in terms of uh, a work of literature, because that's, that's sort of how we're approaching it in the Gospel of John. Um, <clears throat> and I'll repeat that in John, the irony is it's multi-layered, which is to say it does involve, it does involve a little bit of, of, of sarcasm. It does involve a little, you know, sometimes he's actually insulting um, the people he's talking to. Uh, but there's this, there's a paradigm, an ironic paradigm in which Jesus is standing before all of these people, these, his disciples, explaining himself. And what he's explaining to them is, you don't understand me. Like, so, so instead of, instead of providing, you know, let's say a PowerPoint with here are the four things you should understand about me. He's just repeatedly saying, here I am. I'm coming from the father. You don't know me. And he's not, he's not, he's not, um, actively moving towards some sort of clear statement so that it, it, it enables this quality of, initiation that I was suggesting earlier but I said I would try to get, come up with a good example or an example um, this is likely not especially familiar to 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 you but it's something you could you could easily look up if you're curious which is um, one of the great one of the great poets of the 20th century was um, the German language poet Reiner Maria Rilke and he wrote this 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 legendary uh, sequence of poems called the Duino Elegies, named after the castle, which is part of the sort of ridiculousness of it. The castle where he was when he first was struck by the lightning of inspiration. In any case, in, in this opening, in the opening of this poem, he invokes these, these angels. We were talking about this yesterday evening, so I guess it's on the table. And Rilke's relationship to those angels is ironic. It's, it's not, and it's not because he's making fun of them or he's trying to treat the angels as a joke, but instead he's understanding that the angels are so, they're, they're so saturated with meaning that there's no possible way for him to understand them. And so their presence in the poem, it's not like they mean anything. They can't, they're, they mean everything. They're this sort of, communicative power. So when I talk about, when I mention the irony or the ironic aspect of the Gospel of John, for me, it operates more on that frequency than some of the other things, which, to repeat myself, are clearly in play, which includes a certain amount of sarcasm, for instance. But that, that's a really good question, and um, it's it's one of the parts of speech that, that is hardest to understand. 
So maybe it's not surprising that the gospel that is the hardest to understand is shot through with irony, you know? That's a really good question. Oh, I think we have one over here, yep. You are so knowledgeable and I appreciate it. My question really doesn't have anything to do with what you have been talking about tonight, but rather <clears throat> reading the Gospels, there's so many questions about what does this mean? Would there be any possibility of you giving classes for us <laughs> explaining any of the Gospels? <laughs> to say, what did he mean? You know, it's like sometimes they contradict, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, I appreciate that. That's very nice of you to say. Um, and I'll, I'll let me check my calendar, uh, and we'll 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 we, we can kind of go from there. But yeah, it's, it's you know it's actually it, we do a lot of our our reading you know by ourselves privately, uh, but it, it scripture is a great thing to read with other people, um, and in fact you know. I, I, I love to read, I love to read difficult texts, difficult or otherwise texts with, with a group. I mean, I have a, a part of a long-standing poetry reading group and we get together once a month and we make our way through, you know, through, through the entirety of, of all these different poets' work and it, it's, 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 it's really illuminating because other people bring, bring their skills to the table and, and you see and, and learn so much new. So, I, you know, whether I teach a class or not, I definitely encourage you to, to find some people to make your way through the Gospels with, just to see. I know our two parishes both have Bible study groups. Um, yep. I believe the one at St. Giles is on Wednesday night, Marcy? Wednesday nights. And um, that is focused on the... It's, circle it works around the chosen uh if you see the but they show an episode and then they talk about it i think and and then there's also going to be um the uh ascension uh saint edmund group is going they zoom on uh, thursday mornings and uh starting at 9 15 and they are going to be starting the book of exodus on mm. the first thursday in november so that might be something that you might find useful. That's good. Any more questions? Yet another. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Questions are good. How long did Jesus travel and preach? Oh, so, the, so in terms of what we know about as far as the, the, the time, timeline, timing, you know, most of this comes from, from the timeline that Mark established. Uh, it's no more than three years. No more than three years. So, uh, you know, could, could even be less if you're, if you're sort of uh, tightening the screws on it. But, yeah. So, effectively, from the moment of Jesus' baptism to the crucifixion, like, no more than three years. It was short. It was very short. We talked about this uh, briefly yesterday evening. You know, his, his, his life, his existence is well attested in ancient sources that are not Christian. So he clearly, he, he clearly um, made some waves. But I think it's also useful to point out that, um, you know, um, peripatetic, that is to say, wandering prophets, healers, you know, magi, they were a dime a dozen at that time. So he, he, clearly, he clearly had to do something to distinguish himself. Um, enough to be mentioned. And hated. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, truly, because that, that his, you know, think about the, the you know, he was, he was crucified, well, the crime he was crucified for was was 
being the king of the Jews, but um, you know he was he was he was crucified by two two others. The you know his his um, his his fellow his fellow victims, and they were being crucified for sedition, so they were being crucified as traitors. So clearly, he was well known enough to be crucified in the company of these traitors. That is to say, he was perceived as a traitor himself. And, you know, interestingly, this is just a, a, little, a, little, a little footnote, a, a footnote in the present tense. You know, when, uh, in, in 1300, when Dante was, was writing the Divine Comedy, that was the worst sin, treason the worst possible sin. And, and the, the next worst sin was fraud. Those are the two worst things that you could do is, is, is betray and to, and to defraud. Think about that, 2022. It's like, <laughs> we don't seem to care anymore. Those are the worst sins. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Is, was that one word sporty, one word for love? Yeah. Was that the correct sport? Well, well, I think sporty, being, yes. What was it? Storge. Storge. Yeah. Storge. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're beyond Storge here. Yeah, yeah, we're we're sure. to philia with Oh, you. yeah. I feel, I, <laughs> we love I feel you, a lot of philia. Yes, yes, for sure, for sure. So thank you so much for all that you have shared with us over these four nights. It's my pleasure. And uh, particularly with you tonight. And uh, always so much fun to have not only renewal, but then fresh new ideas on how to fresh look at a scripture. Yeah, good. Um, and that's been fun. So I really am grateful and appreciative. Thank you. So, so let's close this evening. Um, I do want to remind people, if you would like a book for Peter, um, they are available, and so is he. So he's not going to be doing a signing at the book table necessarily tomorrow, <laughs> but he will do one at our St. Giles table tonight. Um, I also want to really thank the staff of St. Giles for their hospitality and um, the, the use of this room, which is so beautiful. But let us just, um, this morning when I uh, looked out a bedroom window at my home, uh, we're right, the cemetery is our backyard for a local cemetery. And the colors of the fall, because there's trees of all kinds, and the grass and the peacefulness was just so beautiful. Um, and I just could, could not stop but help but praise God. So I'd like to praise God for this talk this evening and for your, and your presence and company. So we could pray together if we would. The glory be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. God bless you. Safe home. Thank you.